there is substance in the budget, which is economic. And the presentation of the budget in the House is not the end of the budget as many people come to appreciate it. The government has no luxury between the 12th and the 31st to allow a slippage in this whole process slipping into April. I think it's, it gives us a certain perspective. And I recall when we had to swear in a president at short notice and tested the, the, the constitution which required that on the death of a president, you know, things, it's envisaged that things would move smoothly. And I think to the surprise of many people, it moves smoothly. I don't want to compare this to that, you know, level, um, but in terms of our economic management, it shows, it tells me, uh, and it's not being contested, so it tells me that the constitution is flexible enough for, to take care of economic crisis, including the absence of the chief executive, I mean the president's um, official, top official in charge of the economy. So I see in that vein um, something that I envisage will be orderly. The majority leader, obviously, has been minority leader. It's a very long, you know, serving member of uh, parliament. He normally even rounds up, you know, the budget speeches in terms of, you know, um, when the minister for finance finishes. So I have no doubt that he is capable of uh, making not just a presentation but he's already master in parliamentary proceedings. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to have somebody who is going to be probably fidgeting or being directed, being educated around this time, because it comes with, the presentation is made in line with the standing orders of the House. And so at the end of which, there's a formal laying of the budget on behalf, not on behalf, on the authority of his Excellency, the President. But having said that, I agree with you also that this is historic because I don't recall in my review of literature since independence and through our you know, military you know, era where whoever is Minister for Finance or even when the person is acting for the substantive minister for finance who happens to be the head of state himself. Uh, there has been a vacuum where the minister is unable, you know, to present the budget. And in this case, it's on grounds of illness also. And so I find it uh, both gratifying in terms of the economy and the processes uh, and the testing of, you know, emergencies and also historic. Uh, that, is, that is something which I think will be, you know, um, uh, for economic advisors, economic historians, I think uh, its significance might come later. Having said that, let me also point out that there is substance in the budget, which is economic. And the presentation of the budget in the House it's not the end of the budget as many people come to appreciate it. For many people, once the speech is over, you know, they tune out. But the budget, as I said, at the end of the speech, which is just a summary, often extracted from the introduction to the budget, it's just a summary. And it's not a speech that is laid 
when that process, after you finish reading and you say, and you, Mr. Speaker, or right honorable speaker, uh, I now take the opportunity to lay, you know, which is a very formal outstanding order. It is not a speech. It is a budget document and the estimates that are being presented to the House. Following which the speaker refers the budget document to the finance committee and to the relevant committees who are in charge of the estimates for ministries, departments and agencies and MMDAs. The process that follows that is very important. Under the constitution, the economic policy of the administration must be debated by parliament presented to Parliament in the budget, debated, and it's actually the first resolution because the economic policy is what underlies the estimates for various sectors of the economy. And normally you will see that, therefore, that it tends to mimic the State of the Nation Address, the economic session of the State of the Nation Address. So this is where the substance comes in that the speech is reading something that is drafted, you know, prepared, approved by cabinet. The debate on the policy is substantive, and that is where the absence of the substantive minister for finance may be felt. Even that, at that point in time, the deputies often step in and attend to the House, because they can also debate. You know, so often the minister may be engaged with other issues, but the deputies then step in. So I don't see, also see a vacuum there. The deputy designates, provided that they are vetted, you know, the course of the week before Friday and the following week, you know, can step in. And you have somebody, you have some of them as economists in their own right, MPs, you know, and. Uh, and of course, much of the work is also technical, and that's where the Ministry of Finance as an institution, you know, with deep institutional and historical memory also comes in to support. And they are normally sitting at the back doing debates. And what you may not notice at times is that they are often sleeping notes when you see the ushers coming in and out, right, or reminders. So I think that is also, you know, First substance. Second substance, the budget in the web budget is an estimate. So that's an accounting aspect of figures of the revenue that is coming in and of the expenditure, how that revenue is going to be used. And it is only parliament that can legislate how the revenue should come in by way of taxation. And therefore, you can see that tax bills that would complement the budget are often laid as well, sometimes that night, because of the nature of the transition. Then the estimates are referred to, as I said earlier, to relevant committees. The committees then meet, and this is not necessarily economic. It can be real sector, because the Energy and Mines Committee meets the ministers for energy, for example, lands and natural resources. The Ministry of Finance itself, its own estimates goes to the Finance Committee together with the budget, you know, itself. So all the committees then take the estimates, and some committees take more than one ministry because they are that, not that many, you know. <clears throat> and the ministers come and defend the government's policy, underline the estimates, defend the estimates, and then they present a report one after the other to the House, and each of those reports is passed by resolution again, right? And when all that is done, the reports on policy, the reports on past performance, the reports on where the government wants to take us, which is the gist of the budget, together with the estimates, the money to discharge that, you know, responsibility or continue with some program which is being, you know, pushed forward. Uh, is then referred, sorry, is brought to the House and approved 
and the estimates, which is the estimate of revenue and expenditure for each of the ministries as they are approved, are referred to the finance committee. And at the end of all the committees coming, bringing in their work, right, and hopefully approved, the finance committee then puts all of them together and then comes up with the appropriation bill, which hitherto would have been drafted by the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Justice, which advises on legal matters. And the uh, Finance Committee, which itself presents the, the uh, Finance Ministry and its agencies, reports as do, because the Ministry of Finance is also you know, a ministry. Um, its own budget and others are put together. And then a report is presented together with the appropriation bill. And it is only when the bill is passed by parliament and forwarded to the president for assent that the process, budget process is set to come to an end. Mm -hmm. So you see the substance, you know, both economic and non-economic in many instances. And this is a process which the minister monitors closely because you have the parliament's own budget, you have the budget of the judiciary which cannot be changed by the ministry or cabinet they must be tabled with recommendations to the House, you know, so all of those things. So the minister has to monitor all of these things, the recommendations. So this is substantive, and it is the minister who moves the Appropriation Act. So again, at the end, I envisage that the period may be short for the minister to come and be vetted, to, to come and take over his responsibility midstream. But we can therefore see the Honorable Majority you know, leader coming back to, you know, take care of the appropriation bill, which again is a legislative process. And as a legislator, you know, he would, he, he can discharge that responsibility. But the deputies would have come in through the appropriation process, which includes debt service and other commitments, you know, and that responsibility too can be discharged. So I envisage that, you know, the, the process, you know, would, would be accomplished. Uh, but you can see from what I'm saying that this all has some history behind them which is going to change. This whole process takes minimum four weeks, most optimistic. But usually it's, um, if the budget is presented early, say early November, it takes about seven to eight weeks because you would not that but for the election years when we present the budget around this time the budget is presented early november and the appropriation bill is often tabled invariably around the 22nd or 23rd of december and then parliamentarians rise for the christmas you know break but the other reason why this has become important and critical, and some have even described it as a possible crisis, is because you recall that in October, not in December, Parliament passed the expenditure in advance of appropriation. And it allows, because the budget can be presented in an election year, every four years, consistently, we have gone to Parliament to ask for money to run government for three months. And the constitution requires that it should be for three months, first quarter. In, but it's not related to elections. It doesn't use election language. It says in the event that the budget cannot, I'm paraphrasing, the budget cannot be presented, right? Parliament can pass, you know, um, you know the, at, the, at the end of the year, right? Parliament can um, approve or appropriate, because it's only parliament that can approve, an amount or estimate that would be sufficient to run government for the first three months, end of, you know, um, uh, March. So the scenario you have is that parliament hasn't got a luxury, and I don't know if there is another procedure, 
emergency process or something in the constitution that can be invoked. Otherwise, the government has no luxury between the 12th and the 31st to allow a slippage in this whole process slipping into April, you know, which Christian as our nation is also, you know, with Easter beckoning and all that, keeping parliament. And so it means that if you look at what is about to happen because of the delay in vetting the minister, then we are going to cramp something that happens in six weeks, in two and a half weeks at best. It is possible the parliament will have to work over time. You know, and there are new members of parliament. You know, the house has a lot of new members of parliament. So the old hands would have to steer, you know, things a lot. And it may be a good learning process, you know, for new MPs because it's going to be very intense. Each of the committees looking at their, you know, um, and, and baptism in, in government policy uh, be very intense. So they may have to work day and night, including some weekends, to have the process, you know, completed in, so that we don't have the U.S. style government shutdown because there will be no money <laughs> to buy fuel, no money to do other things. But as I said, I'm not sure if there is a provision which government is thinking we can make some emergency appropriation to the government and allow additional more days. So that is something, again, which, uh, given developments, we are going to. But let me make a, a, you know, another point on this. I think what I have said has um, given enough reason why normally after an election, even if the government, you know, succeeds itself, the Minister for Finance is often the first. But in the case of the uh, last elections, because of the senior minister, he was the first, but the Minister for Finance is the second to be vetted in order that, and the reason is that this is done sometimes early in January after the handing over to allow the minister to take over the budget responsibilities and present the budget earlier than we are seeing you know, now. Uh, and so that is why I said that it is testing our ability also in an emergency you know, where someone has to step in you know, to see the alternative scenario, which is, you know, but it's not going to be, it's going to be a really, you know, cramped program. And remember, Parliament is also going to be considering the state of the nation address. You know, that, some of that, those debates, I don't know about the President's one, whether it will be deferred to the next sitting of Parliament to give priority to the budget. You know, but that is the Chief Executive's, you know, statement. And so, uh, I'm keen to look at the um, business statement that will be made in the house. A tough budget. No question about it. And the numbers speak for itself. And the numbers have been um, some of the alternative numbers that are coming out, that will used to come out, including some of us disputing certain things being done on, say, a narrow basis. Uh, you have institutions like Moody's, the IMF, and others, you know, showing what you call the parallel, you know, numbers. So to give you an example, debt is at 80%. We shouldn't be comfortable with 80%. And I have said that we cannot compare ourselves to a developed country which is borrowing at 100%. They are borrowing at sub you know, almost negative rates, interest rates now, 1%, 2%, at most 4%. You know, we do our borrowing and bonds, the best is, you know, not even 6%, but 8%. So the cost of borrowing is high, and it takes a lot of money to service as a poor country um, or a developing country. Um, so that le debt at that level is unsustainable. It's been described, Ghana has been described as being at risk of debt distress. It is also not sufficient comfort that the deficit, which the government itself, if you take three of their documents, originally said 2020 deficit was going to be 45 or 4.7 percent. 
by the time the media review was being read had risen to 8.5 but if you add the energy costs which are uh, taken out of the narrow basis the government's you know um, if you add it it gives the government's own deficit as 11 plus percent now there has been some effort to attribute most of this to COVID, but we have had the occasion to go to the IMF to get money for COVID. And we have told the IMF that the cost of borrowing is between 23 to 2.5%. So even if you added the cost of COVID to the 4.5, 2.5 plus 4.5, you are having about 7%. So if your deficit is around 13%, and Fitch and others have said it could be 15% or more, what is accounting for the gap? And it's explained by the adjustments that were made when the media review was presented. Mm -hmm. It is basically energy, arrears, you know, bailout costs, which is another form of arrears, uh, additional money for interest payment. Remember, I spoke about the cost of, you know, borrowing, additional payments for wage arrears. And as we speak, the government has not even uh, finished negotiation with labor which means that whatever is in the expenditure in advance of appropriation will be conservative. And so if you take the last indicator, which is suggesting that government could do 2021 deficit of 8.5, right? That is a climb down from about 18, 15 to 18% to 8%. We have done IMF programs, we've done under austere conditions and whatever. We have never reduced the deficit by that number before. We have never done it, except for the set of that was done in 2017. And even that was 2.3%. And so it tells you that the projections that the government presented in the expenditure in advance of appropriation made it very conservative. Um, West still, that 8.5% was achieved, or so, or so, sorry, was projected because areas were left out. If you take the expenditure in advance of appropriation and the medium term expenditure framework, there's no provision for areas. There's no provision for uh, bailout costs. And even as we speak, it's being paid away in 2021. There's no provision for energy you know, costs. So if you add that, I don't envisage how, which would have increased the deficits. I don't envisage how we could do a deficit reduction, you know, from about 15% to 8%. Mm -hmm. Remember, if you have a big deficit, you must finance it, and that means borrowing. And so the, being at 80% and envisaging a large, you know, uh, fiscal deficit means that we're going to borrow. And if you borrow domestic, it means you are crowding out credit to the private sector. If you borrow externally, already we are being told that our debt is unsustainable. And uh, Moody's has said that we could be at 80%. The, the Bank of Ghana came out with 74.4%, if you remember. But that figure is up to the end of November. It doesn't include December figures. So it means that the debt could be closer you know, to Moody's calculation of 80%, which is what, you know, some of us also. And so the, you see enormity of borrowing, which already the minister had indicated for refinancing. The bond alone is $5 billion, and we are not yet in the market for that. So if you look at the fiscal situation, it is not. And if we are going to follow the advice of the governor, who made two profound, two very important, if not profound statements, one, he said the bank may not be in a position to provide you know, support for the budget. Remember that the bank gave 10 billion last year you know, to the Ministry of Finance, which is more than what we got from the IMF. Right? So if you convert, it's about 1.7 billion US dollars right, from the IMF, uh, which is higher than the 1 billion we borrow from the IMF. So if you add the IMF to the central bank alone, before you bring in what uh, World Bank and others gave us, 
then you are talking about you know 2.7 or nearly 3 billion US dollars of support after we had gone to the market to borrow 3 billion you know sovereign bonds so it means that budget support for last year is hovering around 6 billion US dollars this could not be attributed to covid you know because if you multiply by 5 you know, 5.4, uh, approximately, yeah, 5 points. Let me use even 5 exchange rate. You know, at 6 billion, you're talking about 30 billion, you know, Ghana cities. What is it that is opening that such a huge gap? The answers are in past offsets that were done, the narrow basis for computation, which the fund and others started to, you know, to adjust. You know, so whilst we were saying the deficit was 5%, IMF adjusted and said it's 5.6. While we said it was 4.5, they adjusted and said it was 7%. So this is a scenario. So when I say it's tough, I mean, this is you know, what I mean by the situation is going to be tough. And we have to do our own austerity, or austerity will be forced on it. Austerity is not a bad word. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it only means sacrifice. And I often relate it, you know, to households. We are in COVID. In many households, the breadwinner has lost their jobs. Beginning even before COVID, you know, with the banking sector crisis, you know, the collapse of the banks, you know, and others. What does the family do? They move into austere mode. Austere mode means food is a priority, school fees is a priority, rent is probably a priority. If you are not in your own house, it's a priority. Many other expenditures are suspended. That family is being austere. Mm -hmm. Right? Otherwise, the consequence, like the nation, is to borrow. It's to go borrowing. Right? Uh, they suspend certain expenditures. And therefore, the government will have to follow suit. And that is why I found it, you know, in my tweet recently that, you know, the government is promising 100 billion Ghana cities, you know, of stimulus into the economy. That is on average. If you divide by four, that gives you about 25 billion annually. And you divide again by six, and you add four billion. All right. And that is the amount needed for only infrastructure. But there's no space in the budget mm -hmm. for our own money to finance that. So it's borrowing. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say there's no space is that two items in the budget, you know, which is compensation and interest payment, is taking between 105 and 115, depending on the year and the statements, the budget statement you are talking about, is taking... 110 to 115%. There was a time when it shot up to almost 145. You added areas and everything. Of tax revenue, which means that you are, you've exhausted your tax revenue and you're even borrowing to pay those two items before you come to the amount needed to service government offices, the uh, amount needed for development if you borrow the repayments. And so I remember this excludes amortization repayment of principal, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I do not think that it's possible to defend investors and others, except for those on the periphery, you know, what we call, you know, the, you know, the, the, those who lend, you know, uh, to countries in a, in a crisis at very high interest rates because they know the country, you know, will be wary of, of, of default. At this point in time, you need soft loan. Mm. You don't need a lot of... If we can get soft loan as substitute, it's very important. And the World Bank is the premier institution for giving soft loans, even as a, developing, as a middle income country. We have become middle income, so we don't have the soft sets of loans. You know, so um, the World Bank has a board, and you have to convince them, you know, that government has an austere 
program to pull back from where it is headed, right? You may need balance of payment support if the borrowing and other things affects Bank of Ghana, crowding and interest rate and others. So you may need, or if there's a collapse in commodity prices and others, which comes from the IMF, as the lender of last resort for developing countries, which are in crisis. It's only the IMF that has a where with that, not even African Development Bank, which also comes in any way to support. So you need a coalition of all of this, including your defeats, your USAIDs and others. So at that point, the development partners together with the EU who are supporting your education programs, mm -hmm. they are supporting your health programs, they are supporting, wants to make sure that you are cutting your coat according to their size. Because remember, their citizens would also be asking for accountability and they must justify it. So let me be very practical in... You know, people say we went to the IMF for policy credibility. This is a story. The truth is that that word was coined, yes, at um, a century, right? And it was used. But the reality is that at a point when the development partners realize the enormity of single-spine arrears, which, by the way, is much smaller than the arrears figures that we are talking about today, right? Even though we have three OFS, not one. When they realized that, they pulled budget support. Mm -hmm. And pulling, out, pulling budget support means that your support for education, for health, and for other you know, critical soft areas of the economy was going to, so, so, uh, to, to suffer. And we were about to go and do the 20, not the 2013, but between the 2013 and 2014 budget. Mm -hmm. And the only condition they set was the only institution that can give them the assurance that your program is tenable, your program is workable, you know, your path to austerity, which you said. And remember, we had a homegrown policy, mm -hmm. is the IMF. The rating agencies from whom you are going to do your bond and others also started to ask for you know that. So it's when you get to that point, you know, that countries go to the IMF. But I would like to remind Ghanaians that we have gone back to the IMF already. After the exit, the RCF is a program. It's a rapid credit facility. Just at the ECF, which is the enhanced credit facility, the only thing is that it has less conditions. And the RCF, by the way, is a COVID law, right? So if you were solid, you wouldn't go asking for that loan. If you were solid, your central bank won't be financing. Which, by the way, the central bank had not supported any government to that level since the 1970s, uh, 1970s uh, 70s going to the 1980s. After ERP, the year, the central bank, because it's bad practice. Right, so the central bank has never supported. You know, the law permits only 5% of your previous year's revenue, which in our case, again, was denied under the zero financing policy from the Bank of Ghana. Honestly, I hold back in advising other ministers of finance. And the reason is simple. It sounds a bit presumptuous because, one, much of what I've said, you can see I'm picking from official documents, from other sources, credible sources, and the rest. But I'm not in cabinet to know the real situation. As we speak, what is the arrears for free SHS? And we can't say that free SHS hasn't got arrears. Of course, there was a relief in they are not going to school, but they are going back to school. They've gone back to school. What is the true liability for the energy sector? Right. We keep hearing figures. Two billion, three billion. Right. The government itself has considered that ESLA, you know, which is bringing 41 billion, where did the revenue go? It has not been sufficient to defray. You know, that. You know, the arrears which was 2.2 billion US dollars, 
which even at today's exchange rate, if you take even six dollars, you know, um, six Ghana cities to the dollar uh, at 2.2, it's a mere 15, you know, billion. Tesla is bringing 41 billion. Why haven't we been able to resolve, you know, those crises? What is taking the money? Three oil fields instead of one, right? And we do have this. Uh, I believe you heard from the vetting, contracted road areas and others. So the only reason I'm hesitant is that, you know, the, even the advice may be on the mark. So we are waiting for the budget to see. And at that point, but I think I've said enough generally using, you know, to show, you know, that the way is only pointing to austerity, which we must do ourselves. Mm-hmm.